No, I'm very grateful to the organizing uh, committee for uh, providing me with the opportunity to present uh, our oral poster mm -hmm. on the relationship between drug exposure and SVR in a cohort of patients with decomposite cirrhosis and HCV genotype 1 infection, uh, which I'm delighted to present on behalf of my cohort. So we know that response rates defined as sustained virologic response with DA therapy for hepatitis C remains marginally lower in a group of patients with decompensated cirrhosis compared to those with compensated cirrhosis or, uh, the, or those without significant liver disease. And there has been um, a lot of identification of predictors of treatment benefit and recompensation well described um, for patients with decompensated cirrhosis in terms of selecting patients for treatment, especially important in those patients who are also liver transplant candidates. As part of this study, we aim to assess the relationship between lidipsphere exposure and sustained virologic response in a cohort of patients with uh, advanced and decompensated uh, cirrhosis. So the pharmacokinetic, pharmacokinetic uh, analysis uh, cohort for this um, study was 314 patients uh, treated as part of uh, NHS England's expanded access program uh, early on uh, when DA therapy became available for patients with uh, decompensated cirrhosis uh, and even prior to uh, the clinical trials being published. Uh, patients received 12 weeks of cefosphere lidipsphere with or without ribavirin. And as you can see, this was an advanced liver disease cohort. Uh, nearly or just over two thirds had Chaspu uh, Turcot B cirrhosis, uh, and nearly 10% had Chaspu Turcot C cirrhosis. Uh, PPI use was common at baseline 46.8% um, of the cohort were uh, receiving PPI at baseline. Uh, this was a prospective. A sampling cohort where three to four samples were randomly collected over 12 weeks for a PK analysis. Um, the pharmacodynamic analysis was uh, that I'm that I'll be describing today was predominantly related to, a geno to the, the patients with genotype 1. So of the 314 patients, 199 had genotype 1. Uh, again, two thirds had Charles Pew B cirrhosis. Uh, and 6% had Charles C cirrhosis. Um, again, uh, over 40% were using uh, PPI at baseline, uh, which is um, in keeping with what is described in, in general, in generally in patients with decompensated cirrhosis. So we conducted a pop PK analysis of, of the entire pharmacokinetic cohort. Um, a one compartment model was uh, used, what best described the dipsphere PK. Population clearance was 13.9 litres per hour with an inter individual variability of 48%. Um, relative bioavailability was reduced by 34% in patients who were receiving PPI at baseline. In this cohort of patients, HCV genotype did not have any impact on uh, lidiposphere exposure. So when you compare AUC in group one, which is patients with genotype one, four, five, and six, and then group two, which is patients with HCV genotype two and three, uh, there was no difference in uh, lidiposphere exposure. In terms of impact of lidiposphere exposure on SVR, um, which is the, the important outcome of HCV therapy, um, on, with this graph it's comparing clearance, but when you compare AUC, there is a significant difference in mean AUC between patients who achieve SVR here on the right and those patients that do not achieve SVR. And when you divide out the um, groups by quartiles of the dipsphere exposure and you compare uh, SVR, so patients in the lowest quartile of, of the dipsphere exposure had an SVR rate of 88%, um, and patients in the highest quartile of the dipsphere exposure had an SVR rate of 100% in this uh, group of patients with advanced and decompensated cirrhosis. We didn't find a difference in terms of SVR between uh, patients who are Charles Pew B or C. So thank you very much.
My name is Hannah Kimvig and I am a research assistant at the University of Liverpool. Today I'm presenting my work titled Exploring the Role of Age in Transporter-Related Drug-Drug Interactions. There is a limited understanding of pharmacokinetics in elderly patients and with recent increases in life expectancy of people living with HIV there is an emergent need to understand the role of age-associated changes in antiretroviral pharmacokinetics. There is an increased risk of drug-drug interactions in ageing people living with HIV due to their high prevalence of polypharmacy and age-related comorbidities. This increased risk of DDIs is set upon a backdrop of limited understanding of the mechanisms that underpin transporter-related DDIs. The current study quantified the expression of the hepatic uptake drug transporter, OATP1B1, as well as measuring the magnitude of interaction between an OATP1B1 probe substrate and inhibitor in non-elderly and elderly adults in vitro. This work aimed to further understand the role of age in transporter-related DDIs and expand the knowledge base to support the management of DDIs in elderly people living with HIV. OATP1B1 expression was determined using an SLCO1B1 sandwich ELISA kit in three groups of cryopreserved primary human hepatocytes, non-elderly, mixed age and elderly. A suspended primary human hepatocyte transporter uptake study was conducted to determine the hepatic intrinsic clearance and the drug-drug interaction between the probe substrate and inhibitor, patavastatin and rifampicin, in non-elderly and elderly primary human hepatocyte donors. Statistical significance between the non-elderly and an individual elderly donor was calculated using an unpaired t-test or Mann-Whitney test where appropriate. Presented in the table are the characteristics of the primary human hepatocyte donors. In graph A you will find the OATP1B1 expression results for the five individual elderly donors as well as the mean of the five donors. The y-axis represents OATP1B1 expression in fentanyl per microgram of total membrane protein, with the x-axis detailing each elderly donor. In graph B, you will find the OATP1B1 expression results for the non-elderly, mixed age and the mean of the five individual elderly donors, with the x and y-axis as described for graph A. We found that OATP1B1 expression in the elderly was 45% lower than the non-elderly and this difference was statistically significant. There was no significant difference between the mixed age and either group. Graph C represents the results for the total uptake of patavastatin in the primary human hepatocytes. The x-axis is the concentration of patavastatin and the y-axis is the total uptake of patavastatin in peak mole per minute per million cells. The red line represents the non-elderly donors and the blue line represents the individual 8-year-old elderly donor. To date, only the 8-year-old donor in the elderly group had been qualified for uptake transporter studies and so this experiment was limited to one elderly donor. There was a 42% decrease in the hepatic intrinsic clearance between the non-elderly and the 8-year-old elderly donor. However, this difference was found not to be significant. Graph D shows the concentration-dependent inhibition of total patavastatin uptake by rifampicin. The x-axis is the concentration of rifampicin and the y-axis is the total patavastatin uptake as a percent of the control. The IC50 was 90% higher in the 8-year-old elderly donor and this difference was found to be significant. This study determined a statistically significant decrease in OATP1B1 expression with increased age. However, we did not find a significant decrease in the hepatic intrinsic clearance of patavastatin, suggesting no significant alteration of the transporter uptake function with ageing. Furthermore, a significant decrease in the rifampicin IC50 value was found in non-elderly when compared to the individual 8-year-old. This implies that OATP1B1 mediated DDIs in elderly adults could potentially be less pronounced in comparison to non-elderly adults. However, due to the limitations of this study, further in vitro investigations with larger sample sizes, including a wider range of substrates and inhibitors are warranted to verify these observations. This data alongside PBBK modelling could provide support for the clinical management of transporter related DDIs in older adults living with HIV. Thank you for listening. 
I am grateful to the meeting organizers for inviting me to present our data. The advanced clinical trial in South Africa compared standard care efavirenz with two dolutegravir containing regimens in ART naive individuals. Dolutegravir effectively controls viral replication and is generally well tolerated. Some patients experience excessive weight gain after initiation that includes dolutegravir or after switching to an integrase inhibitor containing regimen. The Tonafova prodrug, Tonafova alafanamide fumarate, or TAF, has been associated with greater weight gain than Tonafova disoproxyl fumarate, or TDF. We characterized associations between single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, and weight gain among advanced study participants randomized to receive TAF or TDF with emtricitabine and dolutegravir. Our methods were as follows. DNA was collected from participants who consented to genetic testing. Genotyping was done with the Illumina Infinium Mega X B chip. We used multidimensional scaling or MDS to address possible population stratification. We focused on genes relevant to dolutegravir, TAF, and TDF disposition. And our outcome of interest was percentage change in weight from baseline to week 48. We also explored genome-wide associations, and our covariates included age, sex, TAF or TDF treatment, and the first three MDS coordinates. I will now present our study results. All 314 participants were black South Africans. Baseline characteristics were similar between the TAF and TDF arms. There was greater weight gain with TAF, 5.8 kg, than with TDF, 2.5 kg. We started with genetic association analysis, which focused on SNPs relevant to dolutegravir and tenofovir disposition. A SNP in ABCC10 for tenofovir had the lowest p-value. We next focused on targeted analysis involving genes relevant to dolutegravir and tenofovir disposition. A SNP in ABCG2 for dolutegravir had the lowest p-value. From these analyses, we found no associations between SNPs relevant to dolutegravir and tenofovir disposition and weight gain at week 48 after multiple comparisons. We finally focused on GWAS for weight gain at 48 weeks among all dolutegravir recipients. The only SNP that reached genome-wide significance was in TMEM163, which encodes transmembrane protein 163. There was no evidence of genomic inflation. And to our knowledge, this is the first study of associations between dolutegravir or tenofovir associated weight gain and SNPs and genes relevant to their disposition. In conclusion, we characterized associations between SNPs and percentage weight gain in advance during the first 48 weeks of ART with dolutegravir plus either TAF or TDF. There were no SNPs in the ADME genes that were significant. Among all dolutegravir recipients, a SNP in TMEM163 achieved genome-wide significance. TMEM163 SNPs have been associated with insulin resistance and waist circumference. It is plausible that it may be involved in weight gain. This association warrants replication in other cohorts. I would like to thank the following institutes shown below for their support and thank you for your time. My name is Holly Rawiza and I would like to thank the conference organizers for this opportunity to present on behalf of my colleagues on the topic of Rifibutin Pharmacokinetics and Safety Among TB-HIV Co-Infected Young Children Receiving Lapinavir. Lapinavir ritonavir is widely used as first-line antiretroviral therapy for young children under three years of age. However, treatment options are limited for co-infected children who require lapinavir. 
Rifibutin is the preferred rifamycin for adults receiving protease inhibitors, but appropriate dosing among young children on PIs is unknown. We previously found that rifibutin dose 2.5 mg per kilogram daily achieved adequate exposures in older children receiving concurrent lapinavir ritonavir. However, the only study to evaluate rifibutin among young children on lapinavir ritonavir was stopped early due to severe neutropenia. In this study, we evaluated rifibutin safety and pharmacokinetics among young co-infected Nigerian children 12 to 36 months of age. ART-naive children first received rifibutin dose 15 mg per kilogram per day as part of TB treatment only for 10 to 14 days, after which rifibutin was reduced to 2.5 mg per kilogram per day the same day lapinavir-ritonavir-based ART was started and continued for the standard six-month TB treatment duration. Intensive 24-hour PK sampling occurred just prior to lapinavir-ritonavir initiation at the two-week PK visit and again, two weeks after ART initiation at the four-week PK visit. At each PK visit, serial rifibutin concentrations were measured pre-dose and at 2, 4, 8, 12, and 24 hours after the observed morning dose of rifibutin. The rifibutin 24-hour AUC was determined using non-compartmental methods and compared to adults receiving rifibutin 300 mg daily without ART, among whom the target mean AUC was 3.8 microgram hours per mil. Clinical laboratory monitoring occurred at baseline and during 11 visits through 48 weeks of follow-up. At interim analysis, five children were enrolled with a median age of 18 months and weight of 8 kilograms. The median weight for age Z score was minus 2.8 and moderate to severe malnutrition was present in all children. The median time on treatment was 6 months at analysis. Severe adverse events were uncommon. Of 171 laboratory evaluations during rifibutin, there were two grade 3 abnormalities and no grade 4 events. Specifically, Asymptomatic grade 3 neutropenia occurred in two instances in one patient and resolved despite rifibutin continuation. In this patient, grade 3 neutropenia occurred at the 3 and 4 week visits and normalized by the 8 week visit. At interim analysis, all patients were clinically improved with resolution of symptoms attributed to TB infection and 4 of 5 patients had achieved HIV suppression with a viral load less than 1,000 copies per mil. In terms of pharmacokinetic outcomes, the median rifibutin AUC was higher during co-treatment with lapinavir-ritonavir compared to during TB treatment only. Specifically, the median AUC during co-treatment was 4.97 microgram hours per mil compared to that during TB treatment only with an AUC of 3.27 microgram hour per mil. Further, Four of five patients, 80%, had an AUC below the target of 3.8 during TB treatment alone, while only one was below the target during lapinavir-ritonavir co-treatment. The rifibutin concentration time curves are shown below, in which green represents concentrations during co-treatment and red concentrations during TB treatment only. In summary, among young children, rifibutin 2.5 mg per kilogram daily along with lapinavir-ritonavir achieved 24-hour AUC comparable to adults. Additionally, favorable HIV and TB outcomes were observed and severe neutropenia was uncommon. However, rifibutin dose 15 mg per kilogram per day without ART resulted in low exposures. Study of higher rifibutin dosing in the absence of a drug-drug interaction, particularly among young malnourished children, is needed. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jomi George, and I will be presenting the preliminary results on a drug-drug interaction study currently being conducted at the National Institutes of Health, the impact of weekly administration of rifapentine and isoniazid on steady-state pharmacokinetics of tenofovir alafenamide in healthy volunteers. As a brief background, the effect of weekly rifapentine and isoniazid on tenofovir alafenamide or TAF has not been studied, which really limits the use of this regimen for the treatment of latent TB 
in persons with HIV who are on TAF-based antiretroviral therapy. TAF, the prodrug of tenofovir, is a substrate for the efflux drug transporter P-glycoprotein. Rifapentine is capable of inducing drug transport in both a dose and frequency dependent manner, which could result in lower plasma TAF and tenofovir concentrations as well as possibly intracellular tenofovir diphosphate. Our study objective is to assess the impact of weekly rifapentine and INH on the pharmacokinetics of plasma TAF and tenofovir as well as intracellular tenofovir diphosphate. Study participants included healthy volunteers between the ages of 18 through 65 with a target enrollment of 18 people. Study design as shown in the schematic here. Participants received TAF 25 milligrams once daily alone for days 1 through 14 followed by TAF plus once weekly weight-based rifapentine and INH with B6 for three weeks on days 15 through 31. Serial TAF and tenofovir plasma concentrations over 24 hours were measured on days 14, and that was TAF alone, day 22, which was simultaneous administration of all study drugs, and finally day 31, which is 48 hours after the third weekly dose of rifapentine and INH. We report the preliminary results from eight healthy volunteers, three of whom were female, with a mean age of 31 years, and full PK data for TAF and tenofovir. The first graph on the upper right-hand corner depicts individual TAF Cmax levels for each patient, as well as the overall geometric mean concentrations by study day in the table right below the graph. Overall, there was a high degree of variability in the TAF PK as shown by the relatively high CV percent around the geometric mean. Compared to day 14, on day 22, there was a 74% increase in TAF Cmax, whereas on day 31, which was 48 hours after the third weekly dose, a 27% decrease in TAF Cmax was observed. The graph on the lower left corner compares the geometric mean exposure estimates as reported by AUC last between TAF and tenofovir by study day. TAF is shown in green and tenofovir is shown in, in yellow. For TAF, compared to day 14, there was an 81% increase in AUC last on day 22, whereas on day 31, there was a 34% decrease in AUC last observed. Compared to TAF, there were less dramatic changes in tenofovir exposure um, overall, a 17% increase in day 22 and a 10% decrease on uh, day 31 uh, compared to that of day 14. When we look at the overall geometric mean tenofovir exposure um, throughout the study um, across study days, the exposure ranged anywhere between about 230 to 300 nanograms per ml hour in this study. And for reference of note in patients with HIV, the mean exposure is reported to be 290 nanograms per ml hour. The last graph on the lower corner, right corner, shows individual patient level concentrations at 24 hours for tenofovir by study day. The geometric mean C24 levels observed in this study were comparable to reference data, although on day 32 we can see it was slightly lower than what is described to be the C trough in patients with HIV, which is about 10 nanograms per ml. Study drugs uh, for all participants were generally well tolerated. In conclusion, there were different effects on TAF and tenofovir PK, which was observed between simultaneous and 48 hours after the third weekly dose. Changes in overall exposure were modest with tenofovir compared to TAF. These preliminary data do not support a significant reduction in tenofovir plasma exposure when co-administered with rifapentine and INH, but it is really important to note that additional data are needed to confirm what is essentially uh, an observation at this point in time. To date, the study regimen has been generally well tolerated and the study is still ongoing. Thank you for your time 